I'm Lytton Smith. I, I teach um, English Creative Writing Black Studies here at SUNY Geneseo um, and direct the Center for Integrative Learning. Um, you know, and, and one of the things the Center for Integrative Learning does is try to bring people together across disciplines and establish connections to community as well as um, curriculum. And so this is just such a, a wonderful um, discussion to be a part of. Um, I'm just going clockwise. So Dave, you're up next. Hello everyone, Dave Parfit. I'm the director of the Teaching and Learning Center. And when I'm on campus, my office is physically right next door to Lytton's in the Center for Integrative Learning. And uh, I'm really excited about this particular program. Um, I do a lot of work on um, DEI issues and anti-racism um, in terms of faculty development work. And I think this is a discussion that we've been needing to have for a long time. So I'm really glad um, to have everybody here in the Zoom room. And it seems fitting to come to, to Jillian next, not just because you're clock, clockwise on, on my Zoom screen, but this wouldn't be happening without you. So uh, yeah, Jillian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for hosting this. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about these these um, issues a lot since the summer. So I'm Gillian Paku. I'm in the English department, but I'm also the director of the Writing Learning Center. And I'm one of the two coordinators of INTD 105, which is our first year writing program. Um, and so we're seeing about a thousand students a year through that program, and most of them are first years. And so I, today I'm really interested in thinking particularly about how in that environment um, we can start to make some of these moves. And I'm also going to say thank you to, to Dave right now, um, because uh, he enabled me via a grant to attend a conference last week um, on the main body of uh, sort of the, the, the main academic body for college composition studies. Um, which uh, really highlighted how much of this work is going on across the country and some of the ways in which we are lagging behind, um, where I think we, we need to get to pretty quick. Thanks. Thanks, Gillian. Um, Sasha L.Y. Evans. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Sasha, I'm the Director of Multicultural Programs and Services. I am a linguist by training, so naturally I'm interested in this topic, um, but also having taught classes on African American English or Black English, um, and then connected to my role um, working with students of color, this, is, this has a lot to do with how they experience campus, right? Um, the feedback they get from professors, the methods it, um, used to uh, deliver the feedback all um, potentially can impact how they persist at Geneseo and whether or not we retain them. So I, I guess I'm here for uh, multiple reasons, but I'm excited to be a part of the conversation. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Wentworth. Hello, um, I'm Amanda Wentworth. I'm the Digital Humanities and Learning Coordinator for the new Center for Digital Learning here at Geneseo. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this webinar for quite a while. So happy to be here. Thank you, Paul Schacht. Uh, hi everybody, Paul Schacht. Um, as a member of the English department, um, this is a, a topic that I care deeply about that I've had a very long standing interest in the interest has been reshaped in recent years by um, uh, our DEI efforts and and all the attention focused on the issues that I know we're going to hear about today but broadly this is something I've been interested in since I stumbled into a linguistics class as an undergraduate in the mid 1970s um, and and, and came to understand some things about how language actually works that have informed my teaching of, of writing ever since. I'm really thrilled to be here and um, excited to learn from you all and think together with you. Wonderful. Uh, Sydney Schmidt. Hi, I'm Sydney. I'm a senior English literature and French double major in the Edgar Fellows program. Um, I'm also a tutor at the Writing Learning Center. I have been for the last two years an ELL recommended Writing Learning Center tutor. Um, and I've done my honors capstone project working with ELL students um, 
with Professor Menick as my advisor. So I'm gonna be sharing the research that I've done, um, but also um, I'm really glad to be here and I feel invested in this as a tutor um, and with the work I've done with English language learners um, in uh, methods of teaching English to speakers of other languages, which I um, participated in as a freshman and also with English Immersion Group um, for which I'm the president. Excellent, thank you, Sydney. Uh, Jennifer Guzman. Okay, good morning. Hi, everyone. I am Jennifer Guzman. I'm faculty in the Department of Anthropology. I'm a linguistic anthropologist by trade. And so um, I talk about these issues of multiple standards and what is a standard and questioning these sorts of things in, in all of our linguistic anthropology classes, language and culture, uh, et cetera. So I'm thrilled to be here on this panel with all of you who think about these issues as well. And so that we can start to brainstorm ways that we can be more cognizant of them in our teaching for writing. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Sasha Algaya. I, I am a, I'm Sasha from the Department of Communication, a faculty member there, and um, I teach uh, media writing courses. And um, one of the things that kind of brings me to, to this topic as well um, has to do with my own kind of um, upbringing as someone who was a war refugee and was trained English by ESOL individuals specifically not to speak in Black vernacular because that was the community that I was growing up in. Um, I, I'm very much aware of the different um, code switching that happens that many of our students do, whether it's speaking in a classroom or even in writing. Um, and so that's kind of my standpoint on, on things. Thank you, Sasha. And Atsushi Tajima. Hi, um, my name is Atsushi Tajima. I'm also a teaching faculty member of communication. And then, uh, yes, and, and just following up Jennifer, um, you know, I'm really, uh, I teach mass media. I'm not really teaching language or writing per se, uh, but I'm teaching mass media, and I'm really uh, uh, talk, uh, you know my uh, course really covers uh, global spread of English, uh, and particularly context of mass media and mass communication. I keep asking the same questions, Jennifer. What is standard? What do you mean by standard? Right, and my colleague, department chair Andrew Hammer, who was uh, born and raised in Buffalo, New York, his neighbor was telling him who is from Scotland. Uh, and then having a South African nationality, said, you know, Andrew, you have a very strong accent. I love that story. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, yes, and also, you know, my own experience that like, just like Sasha, uh, my colleague Sasha, my own experience as an uh, ESL learner. Uh, and I hated learning English when I was a kid. I hated it, super hated it. And then, but uh, for some reason, I'm sticking with uh, in the U.S. University in teaching communications. It was an irony. <laughs> but anyway, so that's me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I want to get very, um, very quickly to um, giving chance for, for, for Sasha and, and Atsushi to, to share before they have to disappear off for an important DEI meeting. Um, just to remind us, there are two questions. How do we or can we affirm and integrate linguistic varieties in writing intensive contexts? Um, and speech has come up a number of times, so we'll think about speech too. Um, how can we work towards and how are we already working towards processes of grading and assessment? Typo, apologies for that, that are anti-racist. Um, um, and I just wanted to share, you know, one quick thing from my own perspective, which is, as I've been thinking towards this, I've been thinking about something that the critic Evie Shockley says about polyvocality. And what I really love here is that she, she acknowledges Mikhail Bakhtin and then sort of sideswipes him to talk about Mae Gwendolyn Henderson instead. Um, and this beautiful quote from Mae Gwendolyn Henderson about um, an acquired ability to speak in a plurality of voices as well as in a multiplicity of discourses, right? And the openness and the optimism. And, and Shockley's thinking particularly about black women and thinking about the role of lyric poetry. But that's sort of been in my, in my thoughts as we, we move towards this and the potential to sort of celebrate. Um, and this comes very much, you know, the fact that this exists comes out of the, the panel standard fair and anti-racist approach to standardized English that, that Gillian Parker and Brian Vargas um, organized during the diversity summit, um, which, which considered the viewpoints of students who identify as BIPOC and presented pedagogical approaches connected to the scholarship on anti-racist writing assessment ecologies. Um, and so that sense that our students have so much to offer us, we seeing so much in the classroom and sort of the optimism of where we might be able to go. And so our final 15 minutes is really designed us towards action, right? What might we do um, moving forward? Um, on into the fall and beyond. 
with that, I, I don't know whether Sasha or Atsushi, which of you wants to, to, to sort of give us some brief remarks next. Sasha, go. Okay, <laughs> I will go. So, so thank you all. Um, for, for this. Um, so first, I want to acknowledge that my, my writing course, as I mentioned, pertains to media, um, and specifically students learn to write in various formats, such as writing for print, radio, TV, and, and press releases. So a little, maybe a little bit different than a standard kind of English course. Um, in some ways, it's fairly simple to integrate linguistic varieties. For example, the, the basic premise of media writing is to write in a clear, concise, and conversational manner. And in my mind, this can be accomplished through various vernaculars, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a standard um, English, so to say. For example, I have a student right now who's creating a mass media campaign advocating for therapy for Black men. And so for the radio and TV PSA they write, it makes sense to write in a, in a Black vernacular kind of wholeheartedly in that case. It becomes more tricky for print style of writing um, since there are set guidelines that were created by the existing dominant system. And that needs to be emphasized that it's the dominant system that created this, where we use the AP Associated Press Style Guide of Writing. Now the guide has um, adapted to accommodate for changing language on topics. So for example, there's a line about why we shouldn't use terms such as illegal immigrant there's also explanations for when to use and not to use terms such as racism, racist, racially charged, and et cetera. So it's really a guide that in many ways is really helpful and it is critical in some ways. But in terms of structure, what comes out of it is this idea of objectivity with journalism as an integral part of media writing. And that's kind of content-based, but this is where I use my own standpoint on this topic to explain why I see an issue with evaluating objectivity when writing. And first, as I mentioned, I was a war refugee and as such, I understand why looking at war objectively can be problematic. For one, I wouldn't be here talking to you today if the side committing genocide was given an equal voice in media, right? Journalists did not allow that to happen and were criticized by that dominant structure for their lack of objectivity. And we can talk more about this on another occasion if needed since it's really complicated. However, what I wanna say is that it's very easy for someone who never experienced war to claim objectivity is important when writing. Just as this case, it's easy for someone who never experienced racism to claim objectivity is important when writing about it. And that is where being an open and an ally comes into place so that we can listen to the voices and choose to take action based on facts rather than looking at both sides of the story equally in that kind of traditional sense of objective writing. And as far as grading, I read a research article recently on grading practices in writing intensive classes where the author discussed how professors tend to see more than just what is on paper that was handed in by a student. One of the things they see is who is the student. So you don't just see the paper, you see who that student is. And we see this commonly play out when we read a paper and we assume that paper will be great just because the student who wrote it has been a star so far. And if that student happens to make some sort of mistakes, we might be more forgiving because, well, they were so fantastic so far, I'll let this slide. But this can be dangerous when the opposite happens because we, if we expect a paper to be subpar based on who is writing it, then we might be looking for negative aspects rather than those praiseworthy comments. Thus, we need to work to eliminate such biases if we find ourselves with them. And one simple way to start is to set your canvas grading to make the submissions anonymous. And that way you have no idea who is actually writing this unless they wrote their name on the paper. But you can ask them not to do that anyway. Another way is to be open to various vernaculars and that they may step outside the boundaries of the standardized form. For example, we can make an agreement with students at the start of the class, you know, when we go over the syllabus and so forth, that yes, there is the standard way of writing and speaking, but we are open to different vernaculars and code switching in this classroom. And on that, I will pass it to Atsushi. Thank you. Um... All right, um, my, my um, 
you know, what I'm introducing is not so much about how we grade, but uh, we, uh, we, uh, I did a focus group study on those minority students. Uh, it's not specific about writing and language, but uh, it's pretty substantial study. Uh, we probably for among these groups and then we interviewed about like 85 students. And then to, again, the language is not so much about the focus of this thing, but I just want to share more about minority students' psychology uh, in terms of their writing uh, and you know how they are assessed. All right. Uh, so so obviously, like uh, most black students, Latino students, Muslim students, you know, we picked up like I picked up, I like, looked back on the transcript, and then I picked up like a few quote, uh, quotes from there. All right. Um, so I'm going to AOP office. I can just be my own person. You know, I have an actual convers. You know, I have an actual conversation. Uh, I don't have to feel like I have to speak the most proper language. I don't have to be very uptight. Uptight, so I I can feel natural. So it kind of like tells uh, you know they not only just in terms of you know writing per se, but their everyday situation where uh, you know oh I I you know I'm not doing right. Uh, and 24 seven in a sense uh, on the campus. Next one is more uh, about the writing in the class. I was born in this country, however, my English is terrible. <laughs> I think mostly because I'm from New York City, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm used to a uh, slang. I think the slang too and blah, 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 right? Um, and then toward the end, it's kind of frustrating because I, I, I'm born in here and I should know those words and I don't, be, I, but, but I don't. Uh, because maybe I haven't went to the best school in the city. My parents, they don't uh, know English either. Uh, I basically taught my, myself English. So um, that's that's more on a specific, but it really tells, you know, oh, I was born in this country. I was from New York City. Uh, you know, it's blaming their background. That's what sounds like. All right. Now, and I have more quotations, but it was the sake of time. I just, uh, um, I was looking at, you know, those uh, transcripts and then uh, here are some thoughts uh, um, I came up with like uh, 35 minutes ago. A uh, number of minority students mentioned they try to avoid taking courses where using proper English is a criterion. They say that actually, because I'm afraid. I, you know, they say often say English classes or language you know, harm classes. So because I don't want to be assessed in uh, based on uh, this language criteria, right? Well, this reduces their diverse learning opportunities for sure, right? Now, the next one is a little bit more complex. Uh, I would say the sense of isolation argumented with adding shame and embarrassment. What I mean by this, is they often acknowledge I already have a sense of isolation because I am the only black student in this class. That's what they want to avoid, okay? But now, not only they don't want to be seen isolated because of their racial or ethnic background, but you know, I'm, I'm afraid I will be more isolated or I'm you know, you know, being isolated, seeing isolated because I don't speak proper language. Right now, the last point seems to be very important. Uh, when they talk about the race and ethnicity, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing for them. You know, some often they are very proud of their racial and ethnic background. You know, I'm minority, and there's a harsh perception on me, but I'm so proud to be black or Latino student. That's me, right? But language thing seems different. What I mean by this is I am not doing proper, that's my fault, right? So the being racially and ethnically minority is something they can be proud of, but uh, not speaking proper English is I feel embarrassed and I feel inferior because that's my fault or my fault in terms of my upbringing, right? So in that case, uh, the sense of isolation due to not using proper language seems to have a harder, higher psychological, negative psychological impact on them. All right, so that's me. So I try to be quick. Thank you.
Thanks to both Sasha and Atsushi. And, and, and it's great to have these sort of brief opening remarks that we, you know, and we can then come back to get deeper into. I know you won't be with us, um, Sasha and Atsushi, for sort of the things to do, right, towards action. But if you, you know, if you have any thoughts you want to sort of send by email or drop in the chat, and I know we'll continue conversations, but already a lot that's sort of sparked thought there. Yeah. Oh, I'll stay now three, three minutes. Okay, fantastic. Great, great. Um, uh, uh, we, we have flexibility in, in where we can go to next. I was going to Sydney. I just wondered if it might be nice to come to, to, to you next and that'd be a good follow on from what was, was being said. Yes, absolutely. So as I mentioned, um, my research was for my capstone project with I did, uh, which I did with Professor Menick as my advisor. So I interviewed uh, six students from her Writing 101 English Language and Culture course from last semester. Um, and I interviewed with questions um, on the affective perspective um, for both writing conventions, which included organization, creative aspects, writing, research, and voice, and also writing feedback. And after I conducted these interviews, I narrowed my focus to formal versus informal peer review, um, and then proceeded to conduct my literature review on the peer review topic, but I also um, kind of branched into the studies of writing support in higher education institutions. Um, and that led me to interview Dr. Paku as well um, about the Writing Learning Center at Geneseo and its purpose and its history and development. Uh, so my research led me to four trends. The first, like I mentioned, is that I noticed students describing informal and formal types of peer review. Four of the six had uh, mentioned doing formal peer review in classrooms or having appointments at the Writing Learning Center, while five of the six described at least on one occasion, multiple students described multiple occasions where they would instead seek support from a friend or a roommate or um, housemate for help with their writing. Um, the second trend I noticed is that there are varied perceptions of the Writing Learning Center. I asked the students, what is your comfort level using the Writing Learning Center on a scale of zero to six, with zero being highly uncomfortable and six being highly comfortable? And the range of responses was 3.5 to 6, and the average was 4.5. But what's interesting is that both the lowest and highest scores came from students who hadn't used the Writing Learning Center. Um, the third trend is that the students noted a dissatisfaction with lack of feedback uh, in mostly formal peer review settings. There were mixed receptions on formal peer review in classrooms mostly, but when asked to describe a time when the students received ineffective feedback, all six participants either explicitly recalled formal peer review indicated a student as the source of feedback or referred ambiguously to people, neither an instructor nor a peer, um, exactly. And the final trend that I noticed was that there was a mixed reception of feedback when it came to conventions versus content in peer review settings. On the whole, students uh, seemed not only to expect but appreciate feedback on conventions in their writing, such as grammar corrections or word choice vocabulary corrections, but there were mixed responses with some students having more emotional responses than others to criticism of the content of their writing, how they stated their argument or how they developed their argument. Um, so I have uh, all of this presentation in greater detail on my great day, it will be accessible and I can also provide more information later on. But as far as one of my literature review sources, I just wanted to state one of the quotes from this. Uh, this came from a study that was explicitly on informal peer review among English language learner students um, at a university. And the author stated towards the end, the tension between respect and appreciation for linguistic and cultural diversity and the realities of writing for the culturally monolithic English academic community needs to be critically examined and contested. So I know this is the goal of today, but I just share that um, to reiterate that because language is power in peer review, especially, you know, this is a setting teeming with power. Thank you, Sydney. And, and wearing my creative writing hat across all three presentations already, I'm like, I need to go and rewrite some parts of my syllabus for this coming fall. So that, that's one action step uh, I need to take. Um, uh, Sasha L. Evans, can we come to you next? Hi, hi, and everybody. Um, 
So when I think of, um, we, we talk about in linguistics, um, prescriptivist ideas, right? Um, you know, prescribing what, how people should speak, what they should say, um, and how they should write. Um, in linguistics, we're descriptivists. Right? We don't prescribe, we just describe what happens with language. Uh, but when I think about of our uh, prescriptivist ideas about language, it reminds me of how I know students of color tend to experience campus life at a predominantly white institution, um, typically met with expectations to assimilate. Um, there is always a focus on what they are doing wrong. Um, I know that language is a connector. It grounds us, it's a way of um, being in the world. So when a student comes into the classroom, they're bringing their way of being in the world along with them. Um, and as Atsushi mentioned, sometimes they avoid spaces where they think that will be critiqued in ways that um, are, are negative and, and don't feel good. Right, and they, they can't just turn off their language. Um, you know, with more practice, you know how to, as the other Sasha mentioned, you know how to code switch. Um, so, you know, students can't just turn it off all the time. Um, and so we have to start at a place of affirming before I think we can integrate. Uh, just because you don't assimilate does not mean you can't um, acquire the skill sets or meet the goals of an assignment. Um, what I mean is that once you see constructions that look different or you presume as, as a reviewer or an instructor to be incorrect, you must pause. Um, you know, there's a lot on the internet um, and I tend to pull a lot of examples um, of people who are part of what we now call the grammar police. Um, and, and oftentimes the memes that I find, um, the examples of bad grammar or bad English as they're described um, are constructions of black English or African-American English. Right? And so most of us, like I said, have negative reactions to language we deem to be ungrammatical or bad broken English immediately. Um, and I, I won't lie and say that I don't, you know, I still have to correct myself when I'm like, you know, rolling my eye at someone's Facebook status because of their constructions. And I can speak a little bit more to, to Black English more specifically, where a speaker might utilize the speech act that um, calls signifying. Um, Geneva Smith is a linguist who describes this as referring to speakers um, putting each other down or uh, making fun or making indirect points um, as uh, behavior. Signifying is the use of indirection to make a point in which a familiar Black English and a phrase or maxim might be utilized, right? Um, or invoked by a writer. I have a five-year-old who always interrupts me. Hold on, bud. Um, to express, and, and usually that, that phrase or that maxim is used to express a commonly held belief. And it happens naturally, and the writer makes assumptions about shared knowledge. Um, and I think it's okay to have a discussion about what needs to happen after you make a point indirectly uh, for, we, for which a reader has no context. So it's okay for a reviewer or a faculty member to have a conversation, but in order to do that, you have to have some knowledge, right? Or you also you have to pause. Um, if a student uses the verb um, to be in its bare form, that's not because they were being lazy or or they um, you know can't speak English correctly, uh, but because they want to highlight an action or a behavior as habitual. So it's important that those reviewing writing pause and check their. I think check our biases at the door um, because unfamiliarity with a social aspect of language sometimes perpetuates narrowly informed interpretation and assessment. 
Um, Anne Edwards writes, above all, remember that communication, correctly formatted or not, is all, is all about understanding. Um, so I say we need to give a little grace when it comes to, to grammar, um, but also assumptions about what is a mistake. Um, make space to have conversations with students, but I think um, biases tend to prevent us from doing that. And I, and it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but I think it will have a huge impact to just ask questions instead of saying, write this over, your, your grammar is terrible, um, but, but ask questions of students, what were they trying to do um, and be a part of a solution, right? That's, that's it for now. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, uh, coming to uh, Jennifer next, if we, if we may. I have to stop taking notes on what Sasha said. <laughs> All right, let me switch over to my notes. And I'm I'm realizing as I think about this that I'm absolutely preaching to the choir here, <laughs> um, but bear with me. Um, so I'll start out by thinking about the panel, uh, our our panel title today, Beyond Standard English, and I wanna poke some holes in that, right? The phrase presupposes the existence of some one standard English beyond which we can metaphorically progress. With no in critique intended for our panel, I do wanna poke some holes in the monolith of the standard. First, the idea of singularity. If we're gonna speak about a standard, we would do so more accurately by referring to plural standards. Um, in London, the Queen's English is standard. For those of us who grew up in the United States, the English spoken on CNN is standard. Notably, that broadcast variety, um, as I'm sure folks from communication knows, um, is based on a variety historically spoken by white folks in central Ohio. But if you live in Lagos, then the standard is Nigerian English. And if you're Jamaican, the standard you orient to is Jamaican English. So the idea that there's a single standard English is both ethnocentric and myopic about global Englishes, right? If we consider as well that the majority of English speakers in the world are multilingual and English is only one of the languages in most people's multilingual repertoires, uh, more than half of all English speakers and writers in the world have what we American English speakers might hear as a foreign accent. And the varieties with which they speak and write are understandably influenced by features of the other languages that they know. So even within the narrow scope of US English alone, there's enormous variation along both geographical and social lines. So there's not just one New York English, but many, not just one black English, but many. Um, and Chicano English, for example, varies whether you're in Los Angeles or San Antonio, right? Um, of course, regardless of where we live, as several of you have pointed out, there's likely to be one language variety that's widely viewed as better, correct, right, superior, good, as in good English. And as we've all noted, um, the moral undertones of those framings, right? So as lots of sociolinguistic scholarship has demonstrated, regardless of where we are, the variety that's viewed as the standard and upheld as the bar against which everyone speaking and writing is judged is invariably whichever variety is spoken and written by the elite with other varieties classified as deviant, problematic, illogical, ungrammatical. So the enduring problem, of course, is that educational institutions, our own not excused, fetishize standard language and demand adherence to it in ways that create, reproduce, and exacerbate class and racial inequalities. Whose ideas get taken seriously and who is permitted access to work in the knowledge economy? Exclusion is accomplished in large part by insistence on written language that approximates the spoken variety of highly educated white Americans. And as the arbiters of success in higher education, our fetishization of standard language is elitist, classist, 
racist and exclusionary. So in a callback to our panel title, how do we move beyond our fetishization of the standard in writing intensive classes? I have three ideas. First, we can examine our own ethnocentric presumptions that our students' writing should conform to what we view as good English. One of the most insidious language ideologies is that the onus of communication falls largely on the speaker or writer, that it is an author's or speaker's responsibility to make themselves understood. But this division of labor that requires effortful expression and simultaneously excuses the receiver, reader, listener from doing any work is unreasonable. As listeners and readers, and here I'm thinking of us in our faculty roles, we also bear responsibility to make an effort to understand. I love Sasha's idea of we have to pause, uh, give a little grace and check our biases. Um, as faculty readers and evaluators of students' language, we can act in better faith by reaching toward understanding rather than castigating modes of expression that differ from our own. Second, we can resist the fetishization of the standard and exercise intellectual autonomy by expanding the range of language varieties that students hear and read in our classrooms. In our syllabus and lesson design, we can intentionally assign readings, documentaries, TED Talks, podcast episodes by authors and speakers who use a range of language varieties. And third, we can explicitly talk about the social construction of language standards in our classrooms, giving students the metalinguistic tools that will enable them to recognize and identify linguistic discrimination and to exercise a greater amplitude of choice in their own authorial decisions when they're writing. And I'm appreciating hearing everyone's ideas as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I'm, I'm, you know, as with all of these, caught, caught writing notes while <laughs> trying to move forward too. Um, uh, could we come to Jillian next? Yeah, I'm. I'm just going to wait for the recording. Um, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't keep notes right now, um, but yeah, it's it's nice to follow on from from what Jennifer's saying because I um, and but partly because uh, there's a lot of the same things in what I've been uh, thinking about. Um, but also, as I um, suspected, speaking last means you've all said um, a lot of the things. So because I am that kind of person, I took the question. Actually, do I have, um, let's see if I can share. Um, so what I did if preparing for this was to was to look at the question and I broke it down four different ways because I'm interested in like what are we doing in INTD 105 what could we be doing um what does that mean in terms of like what we as instructors bring to the classroom what are we actually going to ask our students to do in response to this and then who are we right so I broke it down into five separate things and then it ended up with 12 slides and it was nowhere near four minutes um and so I had to abandon it but I just want to point out it's there. Um, <laughs> and of course, you've covered a lot of those things anyway. So I think I might actually use um, use my time to do a bit of um, show and tell. I'll take you to, to I want to I want to show you um, a, is in INTD 106 at the moment. Um, oh, I, I, how much is, is the picture covering? Can you see that slide? Okay, all right. Um, so this is a, a student who identifies as Black and Hispanic. Um, INTD 106 is the current co-requisite of INTD 105. It's an online course. Um, it's about to be defunded. It will no longer be the co-requisite of INTD 105 starting in 421. Um, but what it was part of what it was trying to do was present um, the conventions of standardized English, uh, not as things you should know or things you should learn or things you should know by the time you get out of the end of this course, but here are things that are recognized to be um, the conventions of academic writing. Given these choices, is there anything here you want to, to um, pick up on and, um, and reflect on why? Like, how do you make this valuable to you? So it's not supposed to be a top down, you should know. But instead, OK, would any of this, if you leaned into any of these ideas, would they help you to express yourself? 
So um, the particular prompt the student is responding to is this one, right? What's something that you prioritize when you write um, uh, write in this form? And I want to say, I mean, feel free to, to, to read um, um, what's on there because this is the first of two slides, um, but partly, uh, partly it's, it's both, this is a student actually talking about the topic, but also um, looking at the expression um, that, that, that the student uses. What I have found in the last four years, um, where I have for various reasons ended up being the, the only instructor of record for INTD 106, that's 4,000 students I've seen um, in the last four years, is that they find it really difficult to think about writing as not an issue of um, what am I doing wrong? Right? Their, their language and the way they talk about their own writing, even when absolutely explicitly encouraged to think about, um, you know, expansion and, 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 and value and use and motivation, all those kinds of questions, they just repeatedly look for what is wrong in their writing and fix it. Um, so it's a, it's a, really persistent message that I think overwhelmingly they are bringing to us and something that just to, just to echo Jennifer, right? we, we obviously have to explicitly counter um, that narrative and it, doesn't, and it doesn't work enough to just do it through a written text. We need to be saying this in classrooms. Um, so anyway, um, the, the student here, I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment and let you read um, more of what, um, of what they wrote. So we have this amazing student here, right? This is a student is really invested in their voice, really believes in the power of, um, of communicating. I'll show you the second, oops. Oh, how do I move? There we are. This is. So there's, there's interesting material in there about the way this student um, imagines um, writing instruction is going to come at them. Um, and uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm now doing a study with the student because I just think this is an amazing two language um, that I, um, want to facilitate to whatever extent possible, but I want to I want to show you the, the next slide too. Um, so this is for Sean Ashanti Taylor, and, and I know some of you saw this um, from the presentation um, a, a few weeks ago at the Diversity Summit. Um, but what I want to point out here is so here's here's for Sean Ashanti Taylor um, uh, code meshing. So um, I I saw him talk last week, um, and he was wearing he gave a keynote speech at the Four Seas um, conference for, for this year. Um, and he was wearing a sweatshirt that said, too proud to code switch. Um, so what he is doing in here is code meshing. Um, so switching would be moving between variants. He's meshing them. And, and he is, all right? So this is, this, um, is written in black English and in um, standardized English. And he's just moving seamlessly between the, the, the two of them. Um, he's also um, a scholar, okay. So I want to point that out, right? This is this is a man who who knows how to use his uh, his languages um, to maximum effect. This is published in a scholarly journal. So this uh, and and obviously it's also making the claim um, that you should be able to publish like this in a in a scholarly journal. Uh, so um, 
I want to um, I, I want to think in INTD one hundred and five, like you know, how do we how do we get students to um, see their language and then see how how um, you know how could um, work for them really really powerfully. Um, so again, I'm just gonna. Uh, I'm going to not talk through all the bulleted points that I had there, um, but I, I do think, you know, just thinking about like who we are for a while, because because I, I do really want a working group um, as a result of this kind of meeting. I know we're all interested in these topics and how could we, how do we create a space where we can come together to, to talk about them? Here are some things that are bothering me from 105 particularly. Well, the first one, I think, I think the more we hear from students, the more we collect those um, those comments, the, the, the better. Um, in 105, it's currently being taught 75 to 80 percent contingent faculty. So I'm I'm all there for rolling out change, um, but I'm worried about a lack of institutional commitment um, to people who are um, in a course that is currently. This is, I think, ground zero for thinking about writing on this campus. This is the first year writing program, um, and I. I I think we need to figure out ways to support um, faculty that doesn't rely on them having to do this out of the goodness of their heart. And then I'm also asking these questions about right. So who are who are we as instructors? This is a predominantly white institution. How do we think about these questions? So um, I uh, probably Dave was going to say this later anyway, but I have a TLC grant. Um, to buy books to bring in a speaker to to help um, a, a group of us to to think about um, how we how we move on this. Um, and I, I have well, I'm, I'm going to just super quickly talk about um, some ideas that I have about grading because I have some quite specific ideas there. Um, again, that there's this. Um, so uh, NOA was the um, president of four C's before Taylor. Um, so I, I also want to point, this is not peripheral scholarship, right? This is, uh, Geneseo's writing program is not where it should be in terms of the way that the central scholarship in this field is currently moving. So the time, um, the time has come and NOA has a, um, a whole grading system that basically does not grade you based on your proximity to a standard, a standardized English that, as Jennifer's pointed out, is, is automatically going to be only one possibility out of many. Um, and as Sasha said earlier, too, is going to be subjective, because how could it not be? So given those two problems, um, could we grade actually based on something that would it would be pretty radically different from the way that most grading in writing courses currently um, currently works. Um, and I do not think is doing writing any favors at the moment, like listening to these students saying they're deliberately avoiding classes because they think the response to them and their language is going to be so negative is heartbreaking. Um, and then the, the final thing I want to say is we can go big too, right? So not only the question of how you are expressing yourself, but the whole idea of like what, what these models of what writing, what models of evidence are, how you establish credibility. So I've been um, glancing into models in Native American um, and New Zealand Maori. Um, but again, there are, there's some radically different ways that we could be doing things um, that I'd be really interested in talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. And um, I got one acronym, um, uh, but I, I don't want to miss miss an acronym ESWAE. Um, and so, if you don't mind filling, um, yeah, sorry, that, that was on one of the one of the slides. I jumped. Um, edited, standardized, written American English. It's sort of making Jennifer's point. This is a very specific kind of standardized English that we're talking about. I put I'll put it in the chat. Um, so a fantastic set of remarks um, here, and, and we, what I'd like to also open up conversation to um, those who are joining us, for anyone who wants to sort of um, share any any thoughts. Um, 
we can um, also riff on points that have been made. Um, and then at about half past in a few, few minutes time, we'll, we'll start moving towards the question that Gillian's invited there about action steps, right? What, what do we do next? But, but just before we, we get there, particularly from those who, no, not, not everybody has to speak, right? It's a round table. That doesn't mean that everybody has to speak. But if anybody does want to speak who hasn't had a chance to speak, this would be a lovely time to hear people's thoughts and, and voices. I just want to thank all of the speakers um, for bringing their expertise here to this roundtable. Um, I think it was an incredible um, display of examples of why we need to um, get beyond the idea that there is one perceived um, standard that we are all trying to adhere to. Um, I think it, it really hit me in Jennifer's presentation too, um, all the different types of English that you could talk about. Um, even if we are focusing on um, the, the academy, um, we're not even in agreement of what is a standard English among disciplines. Um, as a scientist, um, the writing I use is very different from say what Lytton would use um, in his creative writing field. Um, so if, if we are in a agreement that even in the academy, there are differences in English and that is okay, then why are we trying to hold our students to this um, um, unreal expectation? And it, it I'm sorry that our communication colleagues had to had to step out too, because I really think they have something um, to offer here. It's communication is the key. And if we are really trying to appreciate um, all the wide diversity of cultures that we have in this country, um, it really behooves us to be able to communicate with each other. So thank you all. Um, I want to echo Dave's thanks. Um, this is this is it's just been great listening to to everybody. It's um, the the somewhat disheartening part of listening to everybody is you know the recognition of how how um, big a task it is to really um, take this on at an institutional level, and I, I you know. I hear what Jillian is saying, and I and I agree with it. I, I don't know I don't know how we do it, but it feels as though um, um, obviously the most immediate thing we can do that's extremely important to do is in the way we design our syllabi and the way we interact with our students in our classes to, to come from that place of affirmation and so on. You know, to to adopt a certain sort of attitude. But the 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 radical solution, it seems to me, has to involve actually um, helping students understand language, and, right? It's because you know what Dave was just mentioning about the way different academic sub communities work. Um, you know, was making me think about how varieties of spoken and written language. The, the varieties are are not always along the same axis, right? They're they're along various axes. So there are, you know, someone in psychology might be more inclined and comfortable using passive voice, and it might be fine in the journals they publish in, in a way that it would not be okay if you're publishing in a literary journal. But those are not the kinds of differences that we're, <laughs> that we, that we're we're most focused on here when we're talking about the problem of standardization. There's differences in register, but those are not the same as actual, you know, differences in the grammars of different varieties of spoken and written English. The, the thing that was the, the thing in, when I stumbled into that linguist, linguistics class in the mid 1970s, the thing that completely reoriented my my understanding of language was that these um, kinds of language I was used to hearing more often than seeing um, 
written, although I would sometimes see them written, right? A whole other area that we, we, don't, we can't get into today is what to make them look like Huckleberry Finn, right? But so you could read a book that was trying to transcribe the dialect that an author wanted you to, to understand. And it, it gave you some sense, okay, there's a, there are other ways of speaking English. Well, you know, I had always understood that those as not grammatical, right? Because the English that I was being taught to emulate in school, that edited standard <laughs> white American English, that was grammatical English. And to recognize and understand what grammar was and that these other forms of speech and writing simply have different grammars from the one that I was being taught, that was that was the, the central revelation. And I feel as though we could teach that to students we, and there might be ways to do it that, that, that don't involve, you know, every student takes a 100 level introduction to linguistics as part of general education because we just we're not going to be doing general education that way. That would anymore. be okay to have everybody take <laughs> I, a linguistics class. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. But it would also be okay to have everybody taking a programming class and everybody taking all the all the things, right? That we this is one of our huge curricular problems. There there are such a long list of things that we feel like every student absolutely has to to understand and know before they leave, but we we you know there isn't room in the curriculum for that. But, um, and so I would be okay with that too, Jennifer, but my, you know, since that's probably not gonna happen, how do we ensure that students get that kind of under, you know, grasp, comprehensive grasp, understanding of the, of the, of the, uh, of these questions and that faculty do too, right? Because part of the problem that we're talking about is faculty who is long past when they're going to take a linguistics class, but but they're getting students work, and then their their students are you know losing points on assignments because of some faculty members' assumptions about what grammatical English is that are just wrong. <laughs> so I'm really interested in in. Um, Again, really grateful for this conversation, and and um, Jillian, um, you know, I I would love to be part of the reading group, and um, I, and I think we do we need to think really big. Uh, we have to you know act act locally, but think globally. So I feel a little bit out of my depth here because I, I'm not a language teacher. I don't teach right. I, the, but I'm thinking about the ways that in my own writing intensive classes, some of my big goals are about familiarizing students with genre conventions. And so, you know, so much of it is um, not necessarily at the nitty gritty of, you know, um, how do you conjugate verbs and sorts of things like that? But it, it, ha, like you were saying, how do you present evidence? When is it appropriate to use a first person pronoun or not? Um, when is it valuable to use a you know storytelling and when is it valuable to have something else? I, I don't I don't know if like movement on teaching writing, you know, can be more helpful in thinking about like genre differences because that's what students really I feel like need to be successful when they get to my class is to understand the way that a genre is organized. Um, but the another thing that I do in my classes is I also don't limit students to submitting assignments just in English. Um, they have to, I have to limit them to submitting assignments in languages that I read and understand, um, but I can at least give them a couple. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if there is room for us also to think about, you know, writing skills and languages beyond just English as well. Um, I don't know, just a couple of thoughts.
I'm, I'm, I'm deluging people with just I'm putting in the chat some <laughs> things I was able to transcribe that you all said about things we can do from the very small scale, right? So switching on anonymity, going back to Sasha's point. This is not exhaustive. I apologize for what I missed, right? Then in, in a couple of places, I'm like, I can't read my handwriting right now. So I'll have to do that one later. But um, uh, but these are these are some things to get out there. And I think we've got about 10 minutes more. Um, it may be useful in the next 10 minutes to sort of come up with some kind of a wish list, even if we anticipate institutional challenges um, that partly could then be topics that the the reading group that the TLC is supporting and and and, and that Jillian has has invited us to can take up and work towards, but also could be ways, you know, to get folks in, involved. I mean, I'm wondering partly in response to something you said, Jennifer. I mean, there's there's a process now where where people are encouraged to sort of reflect on syllabi and sort of think about you know the whiteness of the syllabus, right? Could we run a summer workshop around, um, you know, affirming variety? Right. So what kinds of English is what kinds of multilingualism does your syllabus have um, and, and sort of helping anybody who wants to. OK, that's a more voluntary thing, but that's what, you know, one step. And I think that the TLC and CIL might be able to, you know, help support something like that. Um, so, yeah, what, what, what thoughts and ideas do people have? And thank you, Gillian, for, 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 for these as well. I don't have a ton of thoughts, but I remember um, I taught English as a second language at um, Syracuse. Um, and um, one of the things that was really important for me is um, I had a book that told me some of the challenges they have with the English language. And so it gave me some, I'm pausing. My internet was just unstable. <laughs> um, one, what, what are the challenges for second language learners of English whose first language is Japanese or whose first language is Spanish? Um, you know, and for me as a practitioner, that was really important to say, maybe spend a little time talking about this English language feature or look out for this when you're grading compositions and papers. Um, and so for me, it would be important to see some sort of opportunity for faculty to engage in, whether it's a workshop or, you know, there's some resources that are compiled that faculty can access. Um, so we may not be able to do a workshop every year to give faculty um, context, but um, maybe there is a, a workshop one year and from that workshop comes a resource that faculty can tap into or be encouraged to tap into because it's not, you're not getting to some destination. I think it'll always be a journey for people who are, who are not speakers of um, other varieties of English. Um, that look very much like English um, orthography in the orthography. I don't know how to change that around. In the orthography, it looks very similar, uh, but structurally is very different. Um, so yeah, that, that would be one idea I have. Um, I guess I could speak to, as far as you know, student perspective goes, um, it definitely, you know, for example, I've taken language and culture with uh, Dr. Guzman. I've also had training from Dr. Paco as a writing learning center tutor. So I am aware of, you know, the backgrounds different students bring when they bring writing to me and they ask, you know, for they expect me to tell them what's wrong or what's right. And I'm paying very close attention to, you know, how I'm saying you want to say this or we say this, you know, these are things I've thought about. Um, and, you know, I'm currently practicing, you know, and thinking about how can I do that better or how can students understand that better. But as I said, you know, not every student, let alone writing learning center tutor has that kind of background. So I do think it is really important to stress that because as I mentioned, it could be any person's sweet mate roommate, you know, um, 
bringing all of these things up when another student asks for assistance or throws around ideas, you know, at any level in the writing process. So anyway, that students can receive that kind of background and understanding of, you know, these varieties, I think is would be really important. I have this sort of universal design for learning dream that goes along with that too, where, where you know, I don't, I don't want to divert attention from the anti-racist curriculum particularly, right? um, but, but I, I think um, every one of us has language formed in some way, right? So I, I can also look at the way that I talk and identify features of it that I was never invited to share in my writing and you know i'm a white native speaker of, of, of english um, so i think getting all students to lean into whatever it is um that uh that so i guess part of what i'm trying to think through is like whatever's rhetorically effective right like whatever helps you make your your point is is good but but um just to, to pick up on something that Sydney said um, not all students have enough understanding of their own rhetorical potential or ability or whatever um, to know what to lean into and what's not actually helping them to make their point um, and then mix that up with the possibility that you're looking at things through a, um, a racist lens as well. Like this is, there's... <laughs> There's a minefield there, right? You can really um, uh, mess with people's ability to, um, to 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 embrace these ideas. I, I, I we think we need. I think we need resources for for one thing, right? I think we do need to actually put curate something that gives um, as many people as possible ways to talk about. Um, about this and to feel included in the conversation. Like this isn't just a thing that other people need to think about. We all have some kind of um, need to think about our own languaging. I think I asked you this question at the diversity summit. And I think I, I, I have been continue, I, I still think about it because um, I'm a scientist, just like Dave. And um, I think that there is an important conversation to be had with regard to this and scientific communication as well. Because really you're just, all that's important is, is that, there, that ideas are communicated clearly, but that is subjective and depending on who's receiving the communication. But, you know, so I don't have answers, I just, I'm really interested and um, thank you. And I will watch the rest. I'm sorry, I came in late. I'll watch the, uh, the first part. Um, I love Dave's comment. <laughs> well, I mean, I even think about like when I'm, I don't know, I was helping a student put together a graduate essay, a per, you know, personal statement um, for, for graduate school admissions um, in science. And, and they had a bunch of contractions that they used. This is, is a white person. And I, I just, I, I don't know, I had been trained that that wasn't appropriate for formal like writing. And this was a formal, this was formal. And I was insistent that she remove, <laughs> remove those. And she insisted back that she shouldn't. <laughs> and in the end, it didn't actually change the mean. I guess this was like my personal growth in a very tiny way, but like it didn't change the meaning of what she was saying in any way. It was just my own, like my own bias towards like not using contractions and formal writing. So, and I, I think like the Jillian, some of the texts that you shared, like I can read that. It's clear to me what the what the um, the author is saying, Vershan, um, that that piece. Like I know what that I know what that means. So that should be that's fine. <laughs> um, and I, I, it was 
it was actually nicely concise in, in a lot of ways, <laughs> which is something we value a lot of times in science too. Um, I don't know. I, I, I look forward to growing in this area. <laughs> if I could just respond quickly to that. Yeah, I mean, like Taylor's at the top of his game. I mean, he knows what he's doing. I mean, it's maximum effective use of code meshing to, to make important points. But I think what, what you said, I mean, yeah, I also look back at some of the things that I've worried about in the past and like, oh, okay, I'm glad I'm learning now. <laughs> um, but I think the other the other thing that we can't like not consider is okay this is a group of fantastic people on the zoom screen right now who are who are all on board with this and uh, it's not clear to me that employers or even <laughs> lots of other people at this institution are on board with this so um that's you know that's that's not easy to to navigate either like there are there are parents who may not thank us for affirming a home linguistic variety that they pay thousands of dollars to not they don't think that's what their their child um wants so i think i think it's really important to think about like who's who's out there beyond beyond the uh beyond what we're saying in the classrooms and how do we you know how do we at least not lose sight of that unfortunate reality and even beyond the employers and what happens after graduation, Jillian, um, I think you're exactly right in pointing out there's probably not even agreement within our own institution um, as to um, how we are assessing um, this type of writing. So even if we could get all of the INTD 105 instructors, instructors on board, which it probably would be very difficult to do that, given the fact that 75 to 80 percent of them are contingent faculty members. Um, if we got all all of INTD 105 on board, who's to say that then those students get into the upper level courses in the major and then they get slapped down with this um, traditional form of evaluation of I cannot tell you how many meetings I have been in where people have blamed INTD 105 for not teaching students how to write, because of course you can do that in 12 weeks, but beyond beyond the utter infuriating irrationality <laughs> of that demand um, is, is also this other layer where, where part of me is like, do you want to think about what you just said there and <laughs> maybe, maybe reconsider. One of the things at the conference that I went to last week, um, there was a, um, a, a panel that was talking about um, sort of language affirmation statements that they're writing. So a lot of institutions have a much more robust writing program than, than we do. Um, and so there are lots of faculty involved and there, they've been writing these and, and the um, four C's has one as well, um, um, demands about um, linguistic affirmation. And so they had, they had slides of the complaints. So, um, I can I can provide you a bulleted list of what people will say if we start to affirm linguistic variety. Those the, I was actually just typing in the chat, but since you since you stopped, it's, I think those terms language affirmation, linguistic affirmation, kind of gets back to what Sasha was talking about too. That is definitely a big takeaway um, for me from this discussion. So. Um, um, for me, for me too, Dave. And uh, um, another takeaway is that I'm 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 hearing that at least some of the people in the room, um, I think, um, focus a, as I decided to do many years ago, mostly on. Um, the aspects of communication that have to have to do with thinking through how you make choices relative to who you expect your audience to be, what, what you're trying to accomplish through what you write, and then um, how you assemble evidence to support an argument how you construct your writing in a way that feels like the reader 
understands what you have to say as belonging to a larger conversation that you're trying to join, Th those kinds of things. And I, you know, I came to believe at a certain point that those were the most important things for me to try to teach to students about writing. But at the same time, I've always felt that that by choosing to focus on that, um, part of what's going on is I'm I'm dodging the other question, right? And I'm not, and so I would say that um, I have been someone who is uh, who takes a, an affirmative stance, but but probably not explicitly enough, you know, more by choosing not to correct or criticize than by actively affirming. And one thing I really appreciate about this conversation and about, you know, the things that I'm seeing colleagues do to be more actively affirming is I think that that's, that's really important to do. And I realize what's been, what's been missing in my teaching from not doing that. But the last thing I want to say here, this goes back to the to what I was saying earlier about linguistics, is beyond aff affirming, I feel as though um, academically, intellectually, there's some kind of obligation there for us to help students um, understand their own variety or varieties of English as systematically following some set of rules that are probably not unique to them. I mean, there are idiolects, right? But, but for the most part, we're talking about people using language in ways that others that they share a community with use the language and they do it systematically. It, you know, it's, not, it's not random and I, affirming is really important, but beyond affirming, if we, if we are not giving students the tools to understand what's systematic about their own language use, I worry that it could feel as though we're saying, we're just, you know, well, um, we like you as a person, we don't wanna be critical of you as a person. You know, affirmation can just feel like it's a, it's a psychological friendliness. Whereas the, you know, <laughs> part of the point is, as is being reiterated here so many times, if you understand language, you understand that there are only varieties, right? And that the different, and, and um, so to help them not just understand that broad point, but actually investigate what's systematic about the varieties of English that they use also empowers them, I think, to say when they, when, when they get criticized, here's what you need to understand to the people who are criticizing them. So, sorry, I'll stop ranting. Um, so I, 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 there's there's so much more to come, and I, what I hope is that people, if they have sort of time uh, to whatever capacity, might might be keen to keep things going on in the fall. Um, and 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 I think you know if it's okay, Gillian, to say that folks should reach out to you to express interest. Um, yeah, actually, can I interrupt for a second there, um, Dave? The the grant money needs to be. I, we would need to decide what we were going to spend it on before June something. Yeah, I actually just um, yeah. learned that when I confirmed with Ann Baldwin. Um, so maybe you and I can do some talking. Uh, maybe there are texts that we could stockpile, um, speakers we can make arrangements for, um, so we can use that pot of money. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd almost like, if possible, if people could indicate interest even if we don't even if we don't get started till before we obviously need to buy the books now and then we'd have the books in the summer but there are so many choices here about the directions we could go in that I'm not super confident like you know part of the proposal that or part of the grant proposal was to to look at the grading processes but I'm not sure if that's what everybody um, wants to do so I would love to hear um, directions so that we could think about yeah where, where to spend the welcome money I, 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 yeah, good, Dave, go on. I was just going to say, I need to uh, step out to get ready for uh, my two o'clock meeting, which many of the people in this room are also in. <laughs> um, um, but Jillian's point is well taken. And um, so we probably should make some movement on those decisions sooner rather than later. So, 
what I was, was going to suggest, and absolutely step out, Dave, and 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 and, and, and Prep. What I was just going to suggest is maybe Gillian, if you're comfortable, sort of sharing a pricey of the the proposal um, with the, the 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 group, um, and um, uh, if folks can join in with you know sort of levels of interest, thoughts on sort of texts or approaches, um, I'll try and put together some notes. Um, um, here and 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 possibly we can start brainstorming you know some broad objectives and see what we can take on and what other you know, i was thinking at one point about the fact that some of what people were suggesting actually dovetails with some of the creative writing faculty are doing with the anti-racist writing workshop book by felicia rose chavez and the ways in which you know i've tried to change my feedback from predominantly written to predominantly conversational this semester, right? Then that's a suggestion that that, that, that Chavez makes. And um, so it, there may be offshoot groups where, you know, there's a central group, but there's another group that's sort of working on that and, and can report back. And there's a, and anyway, I'm getting overcomplicated. But if, if, you, if you feel like, um, you know, sharing that out, then I think, you know, there's a lot we can do here. And I, I wanna recognize optimism here. There are definitely institutional obstacles. Um, but I think there is a lot that we can achieve. And I, most of all today, I'm just so grateful. That long list, which was not the list of everything that I was able to type out of things that are being done and can be done. And some of them just instantly, right? Could even be implemented in a class next week. Make me really feel very hopeful. So I wanna thank everybody for participating today. Can I fit in one more thing before we go? So um, given what we've talked about, if there are undergraduate students you know of who might be interested in an introduction to linguistics class, Sasha is teaching one this summer and she's also teaching um, African-American English also. So if you have students who might be interested. Yeah. Sasha, I hope you don't mind my mentioning that. No, thanks. Thanks Jennifer for doing that, yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's great to know. And if you um, uh, maybe you can also send the, the, the course descriptions or course numbers around to the, the group, then we can also try and circulate that um, to others. That would be great. All right. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you for a wonderful discussion this afternoon. I look forward to next steps to come and let the CIL and TLC know if we can help in any way at all.